go ahead and get to the lesson this evening. Well, we've got nowhere to go left in 1 Samuel, so I suppose we'll go to 2 Samuel, chapter 1. 2 Samuel, chapter 1. It is one continuous story, but it, it is obviously uh, the, the right part for the breaking point um, to divide this into two different books, right? Because you've, you've dealt with 1 Samuel, which dealt with the reign of, of King Saul, and the end of 1 Samuel is, is the perfect spot to, to end that and have 2 Samuel pick up with the next line of thought. Of course, chapter 31, it was our last text that we read and studied last week. Saul died in battle with the Philistines. Um, he was hit during battle, mortally wounded, falls upon his own sword, and dies there uh, in that battle. That battle also saw three of Saul's sons killed, all of those that would have been naturally the next in line, according, of course, Jonathan, and then two of Jonathan's brothers as well, also killed in that same battle. <laughs> Well, the logical question that follows is, well, what's next, right? What happens? It's really easy in one sense to say, well, I guess David's the next king, right? And um, it's just as easy as that, isn't it? Well, it's not quite as easy as that, at least not initially. Uh, reality sometimes is complicated, and the early part of 2 Samuel is going to show us that there's a little turmoil that comes next before David can be fully recognized as king nationwide over the entire nation of Israel. We're going to talk about that tonight as we look at the two thrones in Israel. And we're going to start picking up the pieces after Saul's death and introduce uh, in chapter 1 and the first few verses of chapter 2 uh, our next series of thoughts uh, as the rest of our story develops here. So 2 Samuel chapter 1, the two thrones of Israel. Now for our first point tonight, let's, let's look at this first passage, and we're going to see here, number one, David learns about Saul's death. David learns of Saul's death. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David abode... Uh, two days in Ziklag. Now, the stories from our last two chapters somewhat overlap, right? Um, David is not at the battle where Saul and Saul's sons are killed. David's not part of that battle. David had actually been sent home by Achish, the king of the Philistines, and David had returned to Ziklag only to find what? That the Amalekites had captured all the women and the children and their belongings. And so David in chapter 30 goes to rescue his people. And Saul in chapter 31 goes to fight for his people. And, and so some of those stories overlap. So David was not part of the events of chapter 31. David was not on that battlefield. David's not part of that storyline. So here in verse number one, we're going to blend our stories back together. Saul has died in battle. Let's reintroduce David, who's now returned from his battle, and he's been home in Ziklag the last couple of days. It says in verse 2, that it came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel, am I escaped? So this man that... that uh, David doesn't recognize, comes to him. He, it says there that he, um, he fell to the earth. He did obeisance. That, that's a term of, of deference and respect. That, that is a bow that would defer the honor and will to another. Okay, so that, that's what obeisance is. Don't, don't confuse it. I know it's spelled like and it looks like the word obedience. That's not what that word is, though. Obeisance um, refers to a bow or a deference of respect. 
We discussed uh, this passage just in passing last week, but let's read it here. This message that comes from this man. Verse number four, and I'm going to read the entire message here together. So we'll read verse four down to verse 10. Verse 4 says, And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. Then David, uh, well, let's stop there um, at the end of verse 10. We discussed that a little bit last week. This young man who uh, it's mentioned here is an Amalekite has come to David with this message. And, and there's a camp that believe that he's telling the truth and that he stumbled upon Saul. Saul uh, fell upon his sword, but, but there's one camp that believes that maybe Saul wasn't completely dead yet. And, and so that this young man, this Amalekite, came and finished the job. And there's others that believe that, no, there, there's, there, there's too many inconsistencies, right? And chapter 31 noted for us that the, the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, and so he took his own life as well. There's, there's, there's a, a camp that believes that this man is trying um, through a lie to win himself into David's good graces. Um, you come to verse number 11, it says, Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him, and they mourned and wept and fasted until um, even. Whatever this young man, it, whether or not you believe that he was telling the truth or that he was telling a lie, there's one thing that he was trying to accomplish, and David... Uh, is going to recognize that. In fact, in chapter 4, if you just skip over there right quick, 2 Samuel chapter 4. Second Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. This is David speaking in a later situation, which we'll cover, but I just want you to note what he says. 2 Samuel 4, verse 10. When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought me good tidings... I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. This man, this Amalekite who comes to David, whether or not you believe that he was telling the truth or that he was telling a lie, you can tell that he thought the gesture of verse 10 in our text, he thought that David would be happy to hear that news. When he brings... Uh, Saul's crown, when he brings Saul's bracelet, whether or not he gets them according to the way he said it, or he stumbled upon Saul's dead body and took him as spoils, like it says the other men did, David realizes what this young man was trying to accomplish. He was trying to, he was doing what he thought was bringing David good news. And he thought David would reward him for that, right? Man, David is going to be so excited to hear this news, right? Saul is dead. Saul has been killed in battle. David's got to be ecstatic, right? David's going to be super happy to hear this. And I bet, I bet he gives the one that, that gives him this message, I bet he rewards them. So we're told here the motive. Um, David sniffs out the motive of this man. And yet verse 11 and 12 tell us that that is not the response of David. David did not receive these 
as glad tidings. Do you know that David was not happy that Saul was dead? You think, well, shouldn't David be happy? I mean, finally, Saul's out of the way. You know, David said he wouldn't kill him, right? David said, God forbid that I should lay my hand upon uh, the Lord's anointed. David would never take Saul's life, but surely David's got to be glad now that, that Saul's dead. He's not. David does not rejoice at the news that Saul died. In fact, it says in verse number 11, he, um, he, he shows that great show of emotion and that great showing of sorrow by laying hold on his clothes and, and he, it says that he rent them. You know, when, when you just in, in frustration and in great sorrow grab the thing that's nearest to you and you just rip and you just tear even at your own clothes and in that expression of sorrow and grief. It says in verse 12 that they mourned, they wept, and they fasted until the evening. For Saul, verse 12, for Jonathan his son, chapter 1, verse 12, for Saul, for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. Now, notice there in verse 12 the, the three groups that it says that um, David sorrowed for. And that he grieved for. It says, first of all, for Saul. Again, you might think that he would be happy because of everything that Saul had done to him. But David didn't celebrate. Uh, he mourned. It says that he, he fasted. You, you would think, man, of, Saul tried to kill him. Saul prohibited David from being able to go home. He took his home from him. He, he pursued him through the wilderness. He pursued him even out of the country uh, of Israel. And you would think that because of all that David had done to him, all the things that Saul did to David, David, he should be happy, right? He's not. And he mourns. Now, I like what one commentator said. He said that this demonstrates that our hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness are chosen and not imposed on us. You see, sometimes when people have things happen to them, or sometimes when people are done wrong, and, and let's just say this, Saul did David wrong, didn't he? There's no way to get around that. Saul tried to kill him. He tried to have others kill him. He tried to take away uh, you know, his home, pursue him through the, the, the land, keep him from being able to worship publicly with the rest of the children of Israel. Saul did David wrong. And yet the attitude that you find a lot of times in people when they have been done wrong is that they resort to, to bitterness and they result to, um, to, to anger. And if you ask them about it, what is a response that you often hear from people? Well, I just can't help it. Or you don't know all the things that they did to me. Has anybody ever tried to kill you? Has anybody ever literally stolen your wife away and given, him, given her to another man? These are things that Saul did to David. And again, he said that this demonstrates that our hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness are chosen and not imposed on us. We are told in the Bible not to return evil for evil. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 8, 1 Peter 3 verse 8, it says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Sometimes when you've been done wrong or people have done you wrong, you, you feel that the bitterness is justified and you feel, you know, that, that you know, you, you tell people, I just can't, I just can't help it. After all that they've done to me, um, th this is, this is just where I'm at. This, they deserve it or any, any number of things, right? We are specifically told in the Bible, that the response of a Christian is not to rail because he's been railed upon. We're not to return evil for evil. We're not to return railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. If somebody does you wrong, 
that does not give you an excuse to do them wrong. I understand that there will be times that you will find it hard to return someone's railing for blessing or someone's evil for good. I realize there is a difficulty in doing that, right? That takes the help of the Lord. Thankfully, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. It, we're going to need the Lord's help to do that. But if you're struggling on how to return good instead of evil, struggle with that. Have a hard time with that. But don't resort to returning evil for evil. Don't resort to returning. You're told specifically not to do that. And for anybody that thinks, well, you know, David should be happy. David, you know, David should be happy as anybody should be to learn about Saul's death. He mourned for him, it says. It says in verse 12 that he mourned and fasted. He mourned and wept and fasted even uh, until the even for Saul. And then it says he did so for Jonathan. Secondly, for Jonathan, this was his best friend, a close friend. You want to talk about a battle that took away a lot. Israel loses their king. David loses his best friend. And then thirdly, it says, and for the people of the Lord, the house of Israel. Um, we talked about it last week. Israel's in a vulnerable position, right? The Philistines have cut them off. They've come north and headed west, and they've even got the people on the other side of Jordan, according to chapter 31. They've got people on the other side of Jordan fleeing and abandoning their cities and abandoning their homes. Israel has lost a number of men on the, on the hillsides of Gilboa. They've, they've abandoned their cities. The Philistines have them, you know... <laughs> kind of boxed in. Israel's in a real vulnerable position and they've lost a lot of good men. David weeps, he mourns, he fasts because Israel's in a bad spot right now. David's sorrow was real. It wasn't put on, it wasn't fake. We'll cover that more here in just a minute. Verse number 13, David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he said, I am the son of a stranger and a Malachite. David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? That's something even David wouldn't do when we thought David was justified to do it, right? Didn't David have the chance twice to kill Saul that we studied through? Two different times Saul was right there, prime position. David could have got him. But he didn't do it. And he said the same thing both times. He's not going to touch the Lord's anointed. So this young man, this Amalekite that stumbles in, and he's all just too happy to tell David that I took care of him, David. I ended his life. I, I ran him through, and he's dead, and here's, here's the crown, and here's the bracelet. David, they're yours. And an attempt to get in his good graces, and yet David looks at him. Um, you didn't think that was a big deal? You didn't think that was offsides? to take the life of the Lord's anointed. You, didn't, you weren't afraid to lay forth the hand, your hand on the one that God had anointed king. So verse 15, David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, again, the question, did this a young Malachite really do it? Was, it? was he telling the truth or was he telling a lie? David wasn't there for the events of chapter 31. So David, you know, David doesn't have a, a word of knowledge to, to know all of the facts of the case yet. So he takes this Amalekite for his word. And yet he tells one of his young men, you take care of him cannot believe that you didn't think this was a big deal, that you laid your hand on God's anointed. You, you, didn't, you didn't hesitate. You weren't afraid to stop for a minute and consider whether or not this would be a good deal. David sniffed it out right away. He reveals later, we read that verse in chapter four, this was done to, to get into my good graces. This was done by, with thoughts of getting a reward from me. And the reward this young man got was that David said, Take care of him. And they took him according to these verses and they executed him. And David said, thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee. 
Number two, David's lamentation. Now, you already know that David sorrowed. You already know that David grieved, and we know that he wept and that he fasted. And yet the next passage of Scripture is going to tell us specifically of the lamentation, the heartfelt sorrow and the words that he says. And these verses here are going to show us that David's sorrow was real. It wasn't put on, right? This is, this is not something that David, you know, he outwardly expressed grief. And then on the side, he, you know, he was really happy. And he, you know, he told the Amalekite, hey, man, good job. I really appreciate what you did. No, David's show of sorrow and expression of grief were, were real. It wasn't put on. Listen to these words, verse 17. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Also, he bade them teach the children of Israel the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty, listen to these words, the beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not on the streets of Ascalon. And th again, those are places in, in, of the Philistines. Don't, don't publish it. Don't, don't spread the news. Don't, don't, don't publish this in those regions. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. David doesn't want any rejoicing. He doesn't want the news spread. He doesn't want the word published. This is not a time for rejoicing. And he certainly doesn't want the enemies of Israel and the enemies of God to have reason to rejoice. Notice in verse 21, poetically here, David's showing a great concern and a heartache for what happened on those mountainsides. Verse 21, ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, let there neither, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away. The shield of Saul as though he had not been anointed with oil. Saul struck down as though he were no more than a common soldier. David realizes the intensity. He realizes the, the, the huge impact of what happened on those hillsides. And, and, and poetically, uh, I'm not sure, and most people don't think that this is really a, a prayer of imprecation uh, against it, but, but poetically, most, him showing that, that what happened on those hillsides needs to be remembered and not forgotten. And there, there, that is not a place uh, where you should expect to see or hear anything good or joyful for a long time to come. Verse 22, from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, the sword of Saul returned not empty. What does that mean? The sword of Saul returned not empty. Well, if Saul went to war, you can be assured his sword didn't return empty. It came back successful. If Saul went to war, his sword came back with blood on it. If Saul went to war, his sword came back having been used and having been effective. And David here in this lamentation and this cry uh, is speaking of the good things that Saul had done as king. It says in verse 23 that Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. Man, they, they were loyal, still loyal to each other. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. I, I am amazed, and I've mentioned this before, but divided loyalty is not something that it seemed that Jonathan struggled with. Jonathan seemed to always strike that perfect balance of loyalty to his father as the king of Israel and loyalty to David as the next king of Israel. And he knew how to strike that perfectly. Ye daughters of Israel, verse 24, weep over Saul, who clothed ye in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold um, upon your apparel. Talks to them about, about, you know, weeping for Saul. Talks about the prosperous times. Praise Saul for the good that he did for Israel, for the times of prosperity that he brought, for the good that everyone gleaned from some of his successes as king. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? Now, let me ask you this. Do those sound like the words of a man that hated Saul? When they brought, you know, when the Amalekite brought that message to David, 
it, it's like his understanding was, David, shouldn't you be happy? Your enemy is dead. And yet, what I said time and time again as we came through 1 Samuel, David reiterates with his words here, David did not view Saul as his enemy. If anything, he always questioned why Saul thought he was the enemy. He grieved, so much so one time that he had to leave the land of Israel, not understanding, not being able to have that trust with Saul restored and questioning, why does he view me as the enemy? Twice I could have you know, reciprocated. Twice I could have taken vengeance upon him, and I didn't. He's not my enemy. And now that Saul is dead, David does not run to the forefront and rejoice. And all right, Saul's out of the way. He's struck with grief over it. Here is a man that truly put it into God's hands. Now, when I say that, I told you about the two times that David had the opportunities he had to kill Saul, but he wouldn't do it. He said, lest I should lay my hand upon God's anointed. And I told you that David was content to leave it into the Lord's hands. But I also want you to know that when I said that, and David reiterates for us here, David did not put it into the Lord's hands and then just sit there with popcorn waiting. All right, Lord, when are you going to kill Saul? That's just going to make everything better. That's going to relieve me of all my problems. That's going to make the world a lot better. Soon as Saul's gone, man, my enemy's gone. The kingdom will be mine. David didn't have that attitude toward it. David truly was content to let God be his avenger, to let God deal with this situation. And when God did deal with it, David was still heartfelt and struck with grief. It bothered him. And you know what? No one would pick an enemy to eulogize them. When it comes time for somebody's funeral, generally the people that you have speak at your funeral are those that were closest to you, your friends, your family, maybe somebody you admired. And David here gives us quite the lamentation and quite the eulogy of Saul. And he speaks about the numerous good things that Saul did. You and I both know that Saul was not perfect. You and I know both know that Saul, toward the end of his reigns, actually did a lot more bad than good. This is not the time to expose those things. We, we covered those things. But David is not... Um, I guess it's, you know, it, it's kind of become a tradition, right, that it, it's, it's ill-advised for us to, I think the phrase is, to speak ill of the dead, right? When, when someone has died, it's not your time to, to, to rejoice. It's not your time to, to come to the forefront and glory that they're dead. David has come with a heartfelt lamentation that Saul and Jonathan have been slain. And he calls them the beauty of Israel. And he calls upon the people to, um, to weep, because Israel has lost their king. And they have lost one that would fight for them, that would go to war for them, that did bring times of prosperity at time. And his death was a loss to Israel. Now, verse 25, How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother, Jonathan. There's a double meaning in that, right? The, there, there's, there's the brotherhood of a close friend, and, and he literally was. They were brother-in-laws, right? Saul, um, David was brother-in-law eventually to Jonathan because of who he married. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. That's the friendship. That's the bond that David and Jonathan had. The friendship that they had, the relationship they had was so close. They could be such confidants. They could be so trustworthy with each other, such encouragers and uplifters of each other. They're, they're, David found a relationship in Jonathan and a friendship and a closeness that wasn't surpassed, um, according to this verse, e e even the love of women, right? Um, that, what a bond. David realizes the great loss that happened on that hillside that day. 
How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? What a eulogy, right? Uh, for all of the things that we've said about Saul. Um, David realized the loss that it was to Israel. Now, let, let me say this, and, and I don't think that it would matter who it was. You know, it, it, we have a system of politics in our country. And listen, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or if it's a Democrat that's in the White House. If, if the president were to be, you know, were to be killed, that's a big deal. That is a strike to the nation, the, the, you know, and, and the, it's not the time for the, for the other party to come in and rejoice and say, okay, yeah, yeah, that's great. We're going to be better off. No, that, that is not the time to be thinking those things. That is, a, that is a strike at the heart of a nation. And David sees that and David realizes that. You and I look at Saul and, and we know that he and David have their differences. And yet these verses should, if nothing else, show us that David really meant what he said in all those passages before. He did not view Saul as his enemy. He was not content to see Saul stricken dead. He realized what a blow that it was. What a heart, right? What an attitude that David had. I, I pray that the Lord would give us that kind of courage and that kind of attitude um, to still, you know, to still think that way toward those maybe that had done us wrong. Number three, David crowned by Judah. Chapter three, or I'm sorry, chapter two. Let's, let's hasten here just a few verses and uh, get to the end. Chapter two, verse one, it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord answered unto him, go up. And David said, whither shall I go up? And he said, unto Hebron. I want you to notice David in his heart still for the Lord, right? You and I both know what the, what the death of Saul means. David's already been anointed by Samuel. David's already been spoken of as, as the Lord's next king. He does not, you know, okay, the, the funeral service is over. The eulogy's been said. Now it's my turn. It's my time. David doesn't do that, does he? What's he do? He asks the Lord, Lord, what should I do? Should I go up? The Lord says, yeah, go up. Where should I go? He says, go to Hebron. Now, Hebron is a little northeast of Ziklag, where David had been. Down there, more toward the region of the Philistines, Hebron is actually in the land of Judah. David's going to go and he's going to return into the land of Judah. Verse 2, it says, David went up thither and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did David bring up, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. So he and his men are, are ready to move back, come back to the land of Judah. They've been gone for a while now in the land of Ziklag in that place, but now it's time to return. And the men of Judah came, verse 4, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. David is anointed king by these men there. Now, we know that the, David had already been anointed by Samuel previously, but now the men of Judah anoint him. That, that what, what happened in David's anointing previously, that was a private thing. That, that was not something that was done publicly in the midst of all of Judah. And yet now we see that David is anointed by the men of Judah as king. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. Now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you, and I also will require you, requite you this kindness, because ye have done this thing. Therefore now let your hands be strengthened, and be ye valiant. For your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. We talked about these men from Jabesh Gilead last week that went and they rescued the bodies of Saul um, and, and those that had been hung there on the walls of that city. Uh, Saul at one time had defended and came to the rescue of Jabesh Gilead and they returned the favor. And when that word comes to David, David gives them a heartfelt thank you. They, they spared Israel a huge embarrassment 
by going and rescuing the bodies of Saul and his sons. And David thanks them for their kindness, uh, recognizes them. And David also knows he's going to need that kind of strong and those kind of strong and valiant men in the days to come as he's proclaimed king in the events that are going to happen in these next couple episodes. He's going to need strong and valiant men by his side. And he's thankful for what these men had done. Number four, lastly, Ishbosheth, crowned by Israel. You see, it wasn't just as easy as Saul's gone. Well, now David gets to be king. Look at verse 8. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim, and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. The time that David was king in Hebron, over the house of Judah, was seven years and six months. Rival kings. That's why we called this, we titled this, the two thrones in Israel. David has been recognized as king by Judah. But there's a rascal here named Abner. Do you remember who Abner was? Now, there were two things. There's two things that we know about Abner. First of all, he's the captain of Saul's host. I'm not sure how he escaped the events of chapter 31. The Bible hasn't given us that kind of information um, here in chapter 31 or chapter 1 or 2. But somehow, Abner is still alive. But there's also something else that we know about Abner from 1 Samuel 14 and verse 50. 1 Samuel 14, verse 50. 1 Samuel 14, verse 50. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz. And the name of the captain of his host was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Abner's family, Abner's cousin. He's a cousin to Saul. He's related. He's the captain of his host, and he's his cousin. And after Saul is gone, Abner takes it upon himself to take one of Saul's remaining descendants, this man named Ishbosheth. He's 40 years old. And he's going to set him up as king over Israel. Reality gets complex, right? You and I both know, according to the history of Israel, Saul is king, and then David is king. And yet there's a little turmoil that brews. We don't have time to cover it tonight. We're going to get into it, right? We're kind of left after the eulogy that David gives Saul, and chapter 2 opens up. David returns to Judah, and they crown him king. And yet at the same time, Saul's captain and Saul's cousin put the crown on another man's head, Saul's son, Ishbosheth. So you've got a king over Israel and a king over Judah. How's that going to work? What's going to happen next? All right. You have to come back next week or a couple weeks to find out. Next week, we're going to have a visiting speaker. Here in a couple weeks, we're going to get back to this, though. But I want you to think... Um, especially tonight, about David and the things that he said. Lord, give us that kind of heart, right? To recognize um, David never viewed Saul as his enemy. I know we talked about that, but it wasn't even that in David's heart, he, it's not something that he said publicly, but deep in his heart, he's like, I can't wait till Saul's dead. I can't wait till Saul is gone. David didn't have that heart. He didn't have that attitude. You and I struggled to get over bitterness like that. David's question um, was not, when is Saul gonna get, when's God going to get rid of Saul? David's question is, God, why does Saul view me as his enemy? And, and when Saul was gone, um, David had a great prayer. He had a great lamentation uh, of grief over losing his king, his best friend, and how many good men in Israel died in that battle. Lord, give us the right heart to to look at people um, that maybe have done us wrong and uh, try not to let bitterness stew 
anger and unforgiveness kind of stir about too much. All right? We're going to find out what happens next time. All right. Let's have a word of prayer.